What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode we are always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to talk about the use of a common cup during the Lord's Supper. Stick around. <laughs> Now, I know what you might be thinking. Ryan, there's a pandemic going around. You can't possibly, in good conscience, think that now is the time to talk about people drinking from the same cup. Well, hold on. This is a conversation that we've need to ha needed to have for a long, long time church, and I think now is the time to have it, especially in light of the responses from Christians to this coronavirus. All politics aside, people are getting sick, and there are people who are at great risk, maybe even mortal risk from this. So it's, it is something to be taken seriously, although the hype of the media is incredibly frustrating. I couldn't even get my regular payday grocery shopping done without having to face hordes of people looking for toilet paper. But I went to church this Sunday, and guess what? So did everybody else at my church. And guess what? The common cup was still offered. Now, I go to one of those Lutheran churches, and we have individual cups too, and we're going to talk, and that's the whole premise. But why are we having this conversation now? We're having it now because we watch as Christians the world go crazy. Well, you people need to trust Jesus more. And then, well, what do we do? Well, lots of Christian churches have just shut down or live streamed their services. And we could talk about that. I think there's a lot of problems with that as, as a solution. But given the theology that they're working from, it, it makes sense to me why they chose to make that decision. Or... What happened first, and literally did not surprise me when I saw it, the, the Roman Catholic Church is not giving out the chalice. They're not giving out the wine. They're only giving out the host, the bread, the wafer. This doesn't surprise me at all, because I've seen the Roman Catholic Church do this before. When I was in the army, I was, I was at Fort McCoy, and I was setting up uh, for Mass for the Roman Catholic soldiers there, and a, and a layman was there, and he asked the priest, because there happened to be a flu uh, that going around, everyone was catching the flu, well, Father, what are we going to do about the Lord's Supper? Oh, easy peasy. We're just not going to distribute the host. Now, I didn't say anything, because it's not my place as a chaplain assistant to say anything, but the gears in my head started spinning on this one. And I disagreed with it. But I get... Hold on a second. Stop sniffing my leg. I get... <laughs> I get where the priest was coming from because in their doctrine of transubstantiation, it's not that the bread is at the same time bread as it is Christ's body, as, as Jesus himself said, take this and eat it, this is my body. It's that the bread becomes his body and replaces the element of bread. The bread is no longer present. It is only the flesh, and, uh, the flesh or the blood, depending on which we're talking about, of Christ, veiled in the appearance of bread and wine. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not what Paul said. Paul interchangeably said bread, body, cup, blood. So it is bread, and it is wine when we partake of it. But Jesus says it is his body and it is his blood. So it's that too. So to let Jesus' words stand on their own, Lutherans, we've come up with the phrase in, with, and under. It is the true body and the true blood of Christ in, with, and under bread and wine. So you're receiving four things in the Lord's Supper, bread and the body of Christ and wine and the blood of Christ. Not so with transubstantiation. And then, of course, there's the extreme fringes. These are, these are just kind of the normal responses. Canceling church, live streaming it, so you can sit in your underwear on your couch and eat Cheerios, and not distributing the chalice. In the middle sit Lutherans. So we always sit <laughs> in the middle. And Lutherans... We occasionally engage in this debate, individual cup or common cup. 
And I think in order to engage in the debate, we should be educated on the topic. So let's give a qu quick history lesson. Up until the Americas, the United States, now 2,000 year old religion, the United States, the Reformed, thinking this is only a symbol, partnered with uh, Mr. Welch's, thinking it was scandalous that the church was consuming wine, switched over to grape juice, then switched over to the common cup because people might get sick from the individual cup. Well, yeah, if you switch to grape juice, they might because you don't have the alcohol content anymore to safeguard against germs. So where we've switched from a gold or a silver chalice that has properties in the metal that prevent the spread of diseases, and of course the wiping of the cup with a very clean, oftentimes soaked in vodka rag, and the constant spinning with the alcohol to protect against infectious diseases, now you don't have that, so it follows naturally, and it's, it's a minimalist approach. It truly is. What is the least we could possibly do and still remember Jesus by having this memorial meal? That's a dumb and dangerous question to ask. What's the least I can do to get away with not getting fired and still earn a paycheck? What's the least I can do to be a father to my children? What's the least I can do and still be a, a husband to my wife? Not a road you want to go down. So the church, for the first 19 centuries of her existence, has always used a common chalice. And that common chalice has, has often been, like I said, gold or silver. This is a twofold reason why. One, what we believe is in the chalice dictates the kind of chalice we would be driven to put it in. This is the blood of Christ given and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Hold on, what, 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 what is, where's the finest chalice that I can put this in? Because this is a precious gift. So it's a maximalist approach. What is the most I can do with this? What, what is the best that I can offer for the reception of this great and glorious gift from God? Now that is a Christian attitude. And second... As I previously stated, the chemical components of the metal itself, which safeguard against the spread of diseases. Look, during the Black Death, it never entered into anyone's mind to either not give the chalice, well, any rational-minded person anyways. Rome did this thing at the time of the Reformation where for whatever reason they weren't giving the chalice to the people and the lutheran reformers were like no jesus said drink of it all of you and so we're going to focus in this video on two phrases it drink of it all of you and the phrase all of you so what rome is doing is the wrong response they should be offering the chalice to their people because Jesus commanded it. Jesus instituted it. This is his last will and testament. And you can't change someone's last will and testament once they've died. Never, it doesn't matter that he's risen from the dead. He died. He sealed his last will and testament in his death. And not even the vicar of Christ on earth can change the last will and testament of Christ. But we go back to the Reformed. We go back to non-denominationals. We go back to Baptists. We go back to idiot Lutherans. So the Reformed, well, you could get sick from the common cup. Well, Lutherans, in a desi twofold desire to A, be like everybody else, and B, not weigh the consequences of an action driven from a bad theology, started using individual cups. So there's two ways we can think about this. Certainly this is a meal. This is a, a foretaste of the feast to come, the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom. So if there's a meal for the masses, there's two ways you can go about it. You can treat this meal like a, a Thanksgiving meal or a Christmas meal or an Easter meal with some 
reverence and respect for the nature of what is happening and get out your finest china because you're having company over or because you don't want to deal with cleaning up afterwards, just plastic cups and paper plates and, and throw away utensils and just all of it in the garbage when you're done. Easy peasy. But that's what happens at the Lord's Supper with these individual cups. By and large, if we believe it is the body and blood of Christ, what are we doing putting it in a plastic cup and throwing it in the garbage when we're done? Did Jesus say when it ceases to become his body and blood? So to err on the side of caution, maybe we should just treat it as if it always is after the institution. We don't know whether or not it is. Jesus doesn't say. But out of reverence for what it was while we were participating and what it may still be because we don't have a definitive answer, it should be treated with reverence and respect. But no. So this practice of individual cups came into the church without weighing the theological implications behind the decision from the Reformed. And then also came the argument, well, people could get sick from the common cup. Maybe in the Reformed churches, because they're drinking grape juice. But Lutherans, Lutherans, uh, Burroughs and Hemmers, professors in 1965 did a study and it was submitted to the Journal of Infectious Diseases. I'm going to read you a quote. Quote, Experiments on the transmission of organisms from one person to another by common use of the chalice showed that 0.001% of the organisms transferred even under the most favorable conditions and when conditions approximated those of actual use, no transmission could be detected, end quote. Point zero, zero, point zero, zero, one. <laughs> but I go on. The American Society of Microbiology, or the American Society for Microbiology, did a study of Christians who received the sacrament, those who go to church but didn't receive, and individuals who didn't attend church at all. And we're just going to skip to their results. Quote, findings of this study indicate that an individual is more likely to become ill when living with children under the age of 12 than when one attends church and receives the sacraments as often as every single day, end quote. And that is from the American Society of Microbiology. What about the CDC? We're all, this coronavirus thing, we're all in on the CDC, So, communion as often as daily, or, um, quote, however, a recent study, 1998, of 681 persons found that people who received communion as often as daily are not at higher risk of infection compared with persons who do not receive communion or persons who do not attend Christian church services. That's from the CDC. So you're not going to get sick. And Christians, we've always believed this. Now, I cite this hymn. Uh, the person who wrote it lived from 1649 to 1708. Okay? What God ordains is always good. His loving thought attends me. No poison can be in the cup that my physician sends me. My God is true. Each morning new, I trust his grace unending. My life to him commending. The Journal of Infectious Diseases, the American Society for Microbiology, the CDC, all say that it is next to impossible to get sick from the common cup. So Lutherans, I'm only talking to Lutherans. Rome, you're going to do what you're going to do. And evangelicals, well, it's just snack time with Jesus anyway, so you don't care. Lutherans, we believe, teach, and confess this is the body and blood of Christ, in, with, and under bread and wine, given and shed for us to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of sins. And 
We know that Jesus says, if you love me, keep my words. What are those words? Drink of it, all of you. What is it? Linguistically, grammatically, the rules of language and grammar tell us unequivocally it is a reference to the chalice that he had, the cup that he had with the wine in it. And he said, this is the cup of my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. It would stand to reason that they all had their own cup. Jesus could have just said, all right, everybody, hold up your cup. And he could have blessed all of the cups and told them to drink, but he didn't. For the sake of, oh, I don't know, communion, a common belief, a, a confession of unity, Jesus gave to all of them one cup and said, drink of it, all of you. And the church did until someone got a bug up their butt about the consumption of wine, and then the reform got a bug up their butt about now we're drinking grape juice and people could get sick. Do you see what happens when we stop trusting the words and promises of Christ? If in the 16th century during the Black Death, the church still did not abandon the words of Christ, why are we? Oh, but Ryan... The wafers. So you're sitting here telling me, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, but you have individual wafers. All right. That, that, let's talk about the wafers for a little bit. So it would also stand to reason that they didn't just take this piece of bread, take a bite and pass it off to the next person. It would stand to reason that they broke it and ate an individual piece, a, a, a wafer of it, a piece of it. So it's... And, and Jesus didn't say, eat of it, all of you. He said, take, eat. The method of eating is not given by Christ. So these individual wafers packaged together, united together, up from the same loaf together, already pre-broken, we're still doing what Jesus said, take it, eat it. We're eating it together. The same bread, already broken. We, we're just skipping this step. The cup, though, the cup doesn't need to be divided equally in order to be drank. As a matter of fact, Jesus says the opposite. Drink of it, all of you. And there can be no poison in the cup my physician gives me. That is the stance of the Christian. And during this pandemic of not necessarily coronavirus, but sheer stupidity of the masses, we owe it to the world, Christians, to stand up and confess, not that we believe that we're immune, but that we're unafraid. Our faith doesn't make us immune, as the charismatics would have you say, give my church money and you're immune, or... The Copelands are, are, are speaking words of affirmation over the coronavirus. We're not that. That's chaos in the church. But we're not the chaos of Rome where we're denying people the mandates of Christ in his last will and testament. Christians, we should be like Paul, sitting in jail, unsure of his future. And Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain. And let this be our closing thought. So Paul said to live is Christ, because if he lives, if he makes it out of jail, he can go to these churches that he's been writing to. He can visit these people. He can press on with his ministry. He can tell more people about Jesus. And that's a good thing. That's a win. But if he dies, well, then that's the greater thing, because then he is in the very real presence of the Lord in heaven with all all of the saints that have gone before him waiting with joyful anticipation in the presence of Christ, the resurrection. And that is the greater thing. So Christians, we are called to live a life of faithful confidence, not succumbing to fear. As the Bible says, be anxious about nothing. It's win-win for us, Christians, 
if 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 I should get sick with the coronavirus, and, and statistically it's not possible, but if I should die from the coronavirus, well then I receive the greater thing, don't I? I get to be with Christ and wait with all of the saints that have gone before me for the resurrection. And that's a great thing. If I don't get the coronavirus, or if I do get it and live, which is the better statistic on, on my age demographic, if I were to get it, I would live. Well, then I get to be a husband and a father. And I get to teach my children about Jesus. I get to get on YouTube and tell you about Jesus. I get to go out into the world and tell sinners that there's forgiveness. And that's a very good thing. So let's stop being crazy like the world. We have a hope. We trust the promises of Christ. And maybe we can use this, Lutherans, to do away with that stupid practice of individual cups. What God ordains is always good. And the research shows us that the government telling us to stay home with our kids puts us at greater risk of getting sick than actually drinking from the common cup. It is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And so we turn to our Heavenly Father and we pray and we humble ourselves. We repent of our sins. We ask for His forgiveness and His mercy and to heal our land. And in the meantime, we eat of the fruit of His cross. Until next time, May God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.